What does it take to cause a spiritual revival? Do we need to pray more? Maybe we need to teach the Bible more. How about confess more sin? Well, welcome to Through the Bible. And revival is what's on our mind today as we witness it happening in the Old Testament book of Second Chronicles chapter 30 through 32. You know, there's nothing better than being a part of God's work in people's lives, beginning with our own. And today's a great day to hear how God is at work in the places where Through the Bible travels. And to tell us about it, we want to welcome Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president, to the studio. So, Greg, where in the world are we seeing revival of spiritual life? Or maybe a better uh, thing to say is, where's spiritual light dawning for the first mm, time? Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question and, and challenging in a way. I think maybe the, the place I'd like to start is let's talk about the things that Dr. McGee taught us about revival. Uh, the, there were several elements that he taught us. One is it's God's doing, it's not man's doing. Right. And he taught us that our responsibility was just to be faithful to get the word out. I also remember that Dr. McGee said if you want revival to start, the thing you got to do is draw, I believe this is the quote, a circle on the ground, yes. and you need to get into that circle, and you need to pray that revival happens yes. in that circle in that first. Circle. And, and that's, and that's a, another way of saying how he said sensitivity towards sin in our own lives, humility. Yeah. yeah rather than saying, boy, the world really needs yeah. revival, uh, focus on uh, what God can and will do in your own life. And then, and then turning to God for forgiveness through Jesus Christ, uh, having restoration, enthusiasm for sharing the gospel. Right. So if you look at those as some of the criteria for revival, I would say we are seeing it in a number of places. And, and particularly, uh, one of the ones we talk about a lot is Mongolia. Yeah. Uh, where, oh. and, and we're talking about in the last decade or so, not right. just in a most recent year. Right. The young church where the, the elders of the church are in their mid thirties. That's and right. Where there's so much growth relative yes. to the population. Yes. To go from zero Christians to almost a hundred thousand in about 15 years or so yeah. is just incredible. All throughout the world, the Middle East, uh, and we've re- made reference to this on this program before, mm-hmm. Steve, missiologists have said things like more uh, Muslims have come to faith in Christ in the last, say, decade or two yeah. than in the history of the human race. Um, and although it doesn't look like revival is taking place in the Middle East, there is a definite uh, quickening of people moving toward Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think of other countries as I travel in my mind around the world. I think about India. Yeah, You yeah. don't really think of revival happening in India, yeah. and yet it is. And Steve, it's not an easy place to be a Christian. There's still a lot of persecution going on in India. I yes. have personally met Christians that have suffered, that have been beaten that have been uh, thrown out of villages, that have yeah. been thrown out of their houses. So just a lot of places in the world, and, and South America, too, a right. lot of revival of spiritual life going on. Right. Well, you know, another way that we get responses from our listeners is by phone calls, mm-hmm. emails, and yes. texts. And here's a few of those short responses that we've recently received. Greg, why don't you read the first one? Here's a short uh, text we got from a Middle East, North Africa area of the world country. Okay. Thank you. And please tell me more about this Jesus. I like that. Tell, tell me about this Jesus. Yeah. yeah. And here's one from India. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I think that's a song. <laughs> yes. <laughs> was blind, but now I see. Can't say it any better than that. And, nope. and here's another one from India. A text message. This Jesus, once again, this Jesus that I met showed me my sin at the same time he offered me forgiveness. How wonderful. Now from Egypt. If I had known I could be forgiven of my sin, I would have sought Jesus out years mm. ago. Beautiful. Beautiful. And one more quick text we got from, again, the Middle East, North Africa region. If it is true what you say about Jesus, I would leave all to follow him. Wow. Beautiful. Let's pray as we begin the broadcast. Lord, thank you for these wonderful messages that we receive from people that are hearing your word, many for the first time. Now show us this, Jesus, as we study ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we've been looking at the revival under Hezekiah. And we've been told that this man, Hezekiah, is the outstanding king after David in the line of Judah. There's no use looking at Israel because it wasn't a good king in that lot at all. But here were several good kings, but Hezekiah apparently being the outstanding one of all. 
And we saw that he was one who trusted in the Lord and that he began to move immediately because when he came to the throne, the southern kingdom was in a sad state. His father, Ahaz, had really led them away from God and they were in great trouble and there was a great deal of poverty in the land, a great deal of need, needy people because of the fact of the constant warfare that had been carried on. Now, this man, Hezekiah, first of all, he opened the doors of the temple, restored that sacrifice that speaks of Jesus Christ. And may I say that the Lord Jesus has to be glorified and honored if blessing is going to come to the people. Now, he led in this reform. He went to the temple. He set a good example And he took all the rulers of the city with him, and they went to the house of the Lord. We saw that last time. Then in chapter 30, he sent out invitations to his enemies. The northern kingdom had not been friendly. His father Ahaz had fought against them. He sent an invitation to them to come down and worship and to celebrate the Passover. And now they are returning back to the Word of God. Now, all of this means that we have quite a remarkable man that we're dealing with here, and that man, of course, is Hezekiah. And I'd like for you to notice a little sidelight. Then I want to say two things about this man that's quite remarkable, and then a word about revival in our day and the possibilities of it. Now, will you notice that in verse 17, where we pick up today, that they have kill the Passover, and they now have the blood sprinkled in the Holy of Holies. And we were told, though, in verse 17, there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore, the Levites had the charge of the killing of the Passovers for everyone that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves. Yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon every one. Now, I think that's one of the loveliest things this king did. He returned the people to God and to God's Word and sent out these invitations. And the northern kingdom, many came down out of these different tribes here to worship. And it was a marvelous gesture. But you see, these people hadn't had the Word of God all their lives. They'd been living in the northern kingdom in the place of idolatry, and yet they had a hunger and desire to want to serve God and obey Him. And they came down, and they were supposed to have been cleansed, prepare their hearts for the Passover, and they weren't. And they went ahead and ate it without knowing that. And it was told Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, he prayed for them. And he said, the good Lord pardon everyone. Isn't that a lovely thing that he did because of the ignorance of these people? And he went on to pray that prepareth his heart to seek God. The Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. Now, wasn't that a marvelous, wonderful thing? It reveals that the form and the ceremony was not the important thing. It was the condition of the hearts of the people. And what a glorious, wonderful thing that you have here. Now, I want you to look at this man because we find that he went out and destroyed the idols because his father, Ole, has had brought in idolatry and there were idols everywhere. Not only idolatry, we're told in chapter 31, verse 1, Now when all this was finished, all Israel that was present went out to the cities of Judah. They broke the images in pieces, cut down the groves, threw down the high places and the altars out of all Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim, also in Manasseh, until they had utterly destroyed them all. Then all the children of Israel returned every man to his possession into their own cities. And then it was a period of great reformation that took place. All right? 
this is the man that's leading in all this. First of all, let me say that he was a man of faith. And when I say that, I mean something by that more than is meant today when we hear that the present-day popular faith and Bible faith are actually not the same. This is what I mean. A member of a certain ism, he told me that there were four things that you had to do to be saved. I asked for it. I asked him, I said, what do you think you have to do to be saved? And I won't mention the four things, but one of them was faith. And I told him, I said, I don't agree with you with any of them. He was a little shocked. He said, well, certainly you believe in faith because I know you preach that. Well, I said, I don't mean faith like you mean faith. I said, all that you are doing is trying to say that if you believe hard enough, you see the modern conception of faith, it reminds me of the old country fair that we used to have, the county fair when I was a boy. There was always there a place where there was a weight and there was a place like a thermometer and there was a big sledgehammer and you come up and you hit this thing and it would knock this weight up that thermometer. You'd see who could, you know, knock it to highs. And some fellow would come along with his girl and they'd challenge him and he'd take off his coat, and spit on his hands and he'd swing that hammer and he'd hit that as hard as he could. And he'd see if he could ring the bell up there. Now, he made a supreme effort. he tried try hard. And it was just nothing in the world but just an effort. And therefore, a great many people say, Oh, if I can believe hard enough, you see. But believe me, friends, faith is not a psychological response to anything. It's not that at all. Faith is not in the feelings, but it's an accomplished fact. Faith is that which is wrought in the soul by the Holy Spirit. It's a conviction that's born in the spirit of man. You remember the Lord Jesus said to Simon Peter when he made that great confession of faith in Christ, he says, Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Therefore, you see, faith is not self-meritorious. As someone has said, It's a germ righteousness. It's not that at all. We're told by grace are ye saved through faith. Well, it's merely the instrument. Christ is the Savior, and it's the object of faith. Remember Spurgeon said, It's not thy hold on Christ that saves thee. It's Christ. It's not thy joy in Christ that saves thee. It's Christ. It's not even thy faith, though that be the instrument. It is Christ's blood and merit just to believe enough. Well, there's no merit in faith. You could believe the wrong thing. Millions of Mohammedans died as martyrs. They were fanatics. Faith brings nothing that it might take all. Faith says, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. And it trusts God. Now, this man, Hezekiah, trusted God. Then he was a man of prayer. And that leads me now to go into this next chapter here, because chapter 31, you have all these many religious reforms that he carried out. And there will be reformation if the Lord Jesus saves you, my friend. He's going to change your life. Remember, he said to that crowd of scribes uh, that day, which is easier to say to that man, your sins be forgiven you, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. Now, they wouldn't answer. They were afraid to. But had they answered, they would have had to have said, well, it's just as easy to do one as the other. It's just as difficult to do one as the other because God will have to do both. My friend, the Lord Jesus said, I knew you'd have to say that because I'm going to say to him, rise, take up your bed and walk because I've forgiven him his sin. Now, if Christ has forgiven you your sin, you've taken up your bed and you've walked friends. You've walked away from an old life. You've walked away from your old sins, and you're changing. If you haven't walked away, you're still paralyzed for sin today. Oh, this man here was a real man of faith in Christ, and it changed his life. 
And he's changing the kingdom too, by the way. Then in chapter 32, then it looks like that God let night come down over his reign. Sennacherib came down from Assyria again and made an attack. And he was ready to make an attack upon the city of Jerusalem. And he began by terrifying the inhabitants. We saw that back in Kings. He went out and said it loud so all could hear it loud and clear that no one could deliver out of the hands of Sennacherib, that no God had ever been able to deliver any people. If they thought their God to deliver them were wrong. And what happened? Well, we're told in verse 20, And for this cause Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos prayed and cried to heaven. Now, this man was a man of prayer and a real man of prayer. And he looked to God. And God delivered the city. Now, not only that, but in verse 24, chapter 32, we're told, In those days Hezekiah was sick to the death. And he prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him. He gave him a sign. Now, I went into this in a great deal of detail when we were back in Kings, in Second Kings, because it was very personal to me as I have cancer. I have not cured yet by any means. And this becomes very personal to me. God told Hezekiah, you're going to die. And believe me, Isaac came in and told him that. And Hezekiah went in and prayed before God. And God extended his life 15 years. God heard his prayer. And I think God heals. I believe in divine healing. But I also believe in calling the doctor also. And Hezekiah, they put a poultice of figs on this boil. It could have been a cancer or whatever it was. And God healed him and gave him 15 more years. Now, here's a case, though, where actually the man had lived his life, served his day and generation. And we find here God calls attention to it. He accumulated a great deal of wealth. You see, the kingdom had become very poor. Now they got a great deal of wealth. And he exposed all of that to ambassadors from Babylon, which he should not have done. And that, of course, ultimately brought the king of Babylon against his kingdom later on. Then we're told, verse 32, Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness... Behold, they are written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, and in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the chiefest of the sepulchres of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem did him honor at his death. And Manasseh, his son, reigned in his stead. Hezekiah had been the best king, now the worst king of all. His son, Manasseh, comes to the throne. We're going to see that next time. But I want you to notice something here that I think is very important to note, that God today in our day is sovereign as he was then in this matter of revival. The wind bloweth where it listeth, our Lord said. You heareth the sound thereof. Thou canst not tell whence it cometh or where it goeth. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. You have to recognize that only God can send the revival. God is sovereign in this matter, and the Holy Spirit is. God's not a Western Union boy or a bell boy that you just push a button and he'll come. You can't give commands to God. I hear today, I command you, Lord, that you do this. You're not commanding him to do anything, my friend. He alone can send revival. And very frankly, you remember in the days of Elijah, even when the prophets of Baal had screamed themselves hoarse, yelled like fanatics, they weren't able to bring down fire upon the sacrifice. And now Elijah, he lays the stones in order, and he puts the wood there and the sacrifice on it and pours on water. Then he prays. And he was a man of like passions as we are. In other words, he's saying to the Lord that, 
He said, Lord, all we can do is just get the stones together, get a little order here, and put the wood here and the sacrifice here, but the fire, you will have to send, and it'll be up to God. And God responded at that time. Now, I believe today that we're seeing a movement. I thought at first confined just to young people, but it's not. It's among young married couples. And as one said to me, he's a man, I would say, in his 40s. I consider him young. And he has a couple of boys, 10, 12 years old, and they're getting away from him. And he told me, he says, I've got to have some answers for some problems. And I found out, I thought I could always solve my problems, but I need God. And today there is a turning to the Word of God. I rejoice in it. I see it now everywhere. And very candidly, I never saw that in my ministry in the church. This movement is largely outside of the church today. And I've seen in meetings that we've had now all over this country, I've seen young people come in by the scores. They never came to conferences before, never seemed to be interested. And then I've seen older people the same way, a real interest in the Word of God. Now, unfortunately, there are some pastors today and some religious leaders trying to capitalize on it. So they're feeding these young people a bunch of garbage. They're giving them this hard rock music. I don't buy it. And they're giving them a great deal of other things except the Word of God. And you remember our Lord said, when your son asks for bread, don't give him a stone and certainly don't give him hard rock. Give him the Word of God. Give him the real Word of God. I think this is the hour, friends, to get the Word of God out. Now, I'm not saying there's a revival on it. There's not. I don't know whether it will be or not. I'm staying on the sidelines today. And as I go about, I told a bunch of these young people, I've told them in about a half a dozen states now, I said, I find out they're listening to our radio program. I say, I'm a square. You don't know how square I am. But they still want to hear the Word of God. And one of them came to me and says, well, we listen to you because you tell it like it is. Well, that's the only way I know how to tell it. I've been telling it that way for years, friends, but nobody listened. (laughs) But today, they're beginning to listen. Are we on the verge of something? I don't know. I'm just praying that the Lord will send it. And I'm going to be very frank with you. If it comes, it'll come, and he'll be the one that'll send it. And I just get my raincoat out in case the showers of blessing come. And I just think I'll not even put the raincoat on. I've never seen a revival in my day. I'd really like to see one, wouldn't you? Now, let me give a challenge to you in this moment that's left to me. Why don't you make an inventory of your own personal life? If you want God to move in on you, let me put these five things down briefly. Am I honest? Ask yourself that question. Are you? Am I truthful? Are you? Am I faithful? Can you be depended on? Am I pure? Are you really in this dirty day and uh, filthy pictures and filthy language? Am I pure? And then, am I dedicated? Are you really a dedicated child of God? Moody heard a man say, that the world has yet to see what God can do with a man that's fully yielded to him. Moody said, by the grace of God, I'll be that man. And for my money, Moody was that man. But at the end of his life, he said, I heard Henry Varley say that. And I can say the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully yielded to him. Oh, my friend, let's get into the stream today and let the water of life Hello, let's get out the Word of God. Did you get those five questions of personal inventory? Let me repeat them for you just in case you missed one. They're valuable for us to think about each one, asking the Lord to speak to our hearts. And here they are again. Number one, am I honest? Two, am I truthful? Three, am I faithful? Can I be depended on? Four, am I pure? And then finally, am I dedicated? These are great to review from time to time. 
Well, we've got just two more studies in Second Chronicles before we return to the New Testament letter of 1 Corinthians. If you don't already have the notes and outlines, remember, you can download them yourself at ttb.org forward slash notes, or you can download the new resource, Briefing the Bible, that includes the notes and outlines of all 66 books of the Bible. An abbreviated version of Briefing the Bible is also available in paperback on request. Just go to ttb.org forward slash Briefing the Bible, or give us a call if you'd like us to mail you a free copy. Our number is 1-800-65-BIBLE. Well, tomorrow on Through the Bible, we'll study the curious life of King Manasseh. If you've ever thought someone was too far gone to turn to God, you won't want to miss it. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here on the Bible bus, and hey, I'll save you a seat. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.